innovation is in our veins Soon the whole world will know our names Sharing our knowledge and freedom reign We here for the people, you know it's our way Setting foundations is part of the dream It doesn't matter if you're new to the game Listen up now, cause we all gon' say Ugh. Elevate, elevate, elevate Higher, elevate, elevate, elevate Higher, we gon' rise up we all gon' shine, work through adversity, stay on the grind, elevate, elevate, this is our time, elevate, elevate. Welcome to the Elevate Podcast, everyone. It's so great to have you all on one more time. It's your boy, Josh. And Reg. And we're grateful to be back on with you for another season, another year, and a lot of drama all to fill it all up. We're excited to be with you tonight. We are excited to be getting into some of the energy issues that we're seeing in this country. Uh, we're also going to be talking about regional problems that we're seeing in, say, Atlantic, the Atlantic region, as well as Alberta and other places, and then the federal issues that are on top of that. And then some stuff going on across the borders. It's always good times to chat about, but we're excited to be with you, excited to be on this John with you tonight. And uh, Reg, how you feeling, big dog? Feeling good. Uh, feeling really good. Feeling like it's a nice new year. Happy to be here. Happy to, uh, I did a little bit of a self-reflection on 2023 and uh, what I was going to leave, what I was going to take with me to the new year. So feeling good. And uh, it's funny, I had a couple of people reach out to me. They're like, did Apple take down your podcast? Like, I haven't seen you. And I was like, nope, we're still here. We just took a little bit of a break. We're, uh, we're humans too. We need a little bit of a time to spend with our families and uh, get some you know, time to really give you a quality podcast and make sure that we have all of our ducks in a row and all the facts that you are looking for. So we took the time to do that and we are back and better than ever. Absolutely. And we're the reason why we take so much time around this time of year, we take two weeks at the end of the year, two weeks at the beginning of the year is because we usually don't take any breaks during the year. And that's why we take such a long break uh, <laughs> over that time. We kind of take, essentially, we take a month off. Uh, and as you, as Roger's saying, it's exactly the time to re- kind of recalibrate, calculate, understand what we're going to do for the rest of the, the year, how we're going to attack the show. And that's what we're doing. And we got Reg over here that has decided to do the opposite, the flip of uh, the L. Pierre, Pierre Polyev. He wants to see, seem a little more wise, adding the glasses to the the outfit and want to see that he knows what he's talking about. You can trust him. And so that's why he's got the glasses on today. Yeah. I was going to say that I actually, um, I, my eyes are actually just tired today, but I was like, you know what though? I'm going to keep them on because I want you to know that I did my research. <laughs> <laughs> and it's funny because I have a friend of, uh, of mine who actually is a CEO of a company and uh, he had his glasses on and I was like, I didn't realize you wore glasses. And he's like, Oh, I don't. They're blue light glasses. And I was like, oh, but you're going up to give a presentation. There's not going to be any blue light. And he's like, I know. He's like, but I've read studies that I look smarter and I, I sound smarter and people respect what I say more when I wear glasses. So I put them on. <laughs> I was like, okay, good enough. So we're going to do that tonight. <laughs> yeah, we're going to continue to manipulate your emotions and feelings just like the mainstream media does. And we're doing that tonight. Uh, so we're excited to be join going with you. Well, obviously, if anyone saw the video we put out yesterday to kind of get you all drummed up, for the current season there was a lot we we went off the air december 16th 17th 18th something somewhere around there and all the garbage that went down mm. between now and then is I, I i thought we were all going on holiday i didn't realize more crap was going to happen i was expecting some things to happen and but i was like man we could have run a show every day <laughs> uh during the break and still had stuff to talk about it was insane what was going on oh i know and it's funny that you say emotions because it was just it was a roller coaster of emotions because i was looking at all the different uh things happening with like the trudeau vacation scandal all the things that um, different ministers were saying and i was like really this is all happening and then the backdrop of the world and what was happening in the world and the different superpowers that were maybe uh doing some measuring if you know what i mean to, to try and insert themselves and I was like, I can't believe this is actually our world right now, but I need a break. <laughs> yeah. Never a dull moment out here. And we'll start off with this. We'll keep it light. We'll start light and then go, go into the heavy. But those who know me, know, following the show for a while, know that, A, yes, one of my passions is politics. One of my other passions is sports. I love sports. I watch a lot of sports. Watched a lot of sports over the holidays. Watched even the old world juniors in Canada came and medal. Uh, we'll not get into that right now, <laughs> but I saw my, my politics and my sports collide over the holidays, over this new year, and it was wild to watch. So I'm a huge Pat McAfee fan. Started watching him probably back in 2021-ish, 
only because he was talking about my favorite football player of all time and Troy Polamalu and the drama that drummed up during his career as a punter then. So that's how I kind of came onto the show. And the show is awesome because they market themselves as a bunch of stooges who just like talking crap about sports. That's how they roll. Uh, but the problem is they've been having Aaron Rodgers on lately, uh, who four-time NFL MVP, fits right into the sports conversation, Super Bowl champion. But uh, he had some things to talk about the COVID, talking about the old vax. And that got some people over at different television agencies a little fired up. Keep in mind, Pat McAfee just signed a deal with ESPN for worth $85 million to have a show on ESPN Airways, who's also owned by Disney. And we all know who Disney's about. They love the DEI. They're super woke. And on their airwaves, you have Aaron Rodgers talking about the Vax and the Epstein list. And it was hilarious to to watch transpire. So obviously, Epstein documents came out. Uh, Before they came out, Rodgers insinuated that Jimmy Kimmel would be on the, li- <laughs> the list. And uh, all, all he said was, Jimmy Kimmel's hoping that list doesn't come out. And obviously people ran with it and blew up media. And poor Pat McAfee. He's, he is what he says he is. He's a stooge who loves talking sports. Politics isn't really his thing. And he got wrecked over social media and didn't know what he had just walked into. Funny to all watch us go down. So... A week goes by, Rodgers comes back on for another Aaron Rodgers Tuesday, which they do every Tuesday during the football season. And Aaron Rodgers comes on saying, I didn't say Jimmy Kimmel's on the list. I was just saying he does may not want the list to come out. And this all goes back to a huge beef that Jimmy Kimmel and Aaron Rodgers have been having over the fact that Aaron Rodgers didn't take the vax. And Jimmy Kimmel, obviously, as an industry plant and problematic individual, says, you're an idiot for not taking the vax. Those are the two stances. And he, quote unquote, apologized and but didn't apologize at the same time to saying people who are threatening his family in my name, don't do that. We don't believe in harming people over these issues. But I didn't say that he was on any list and I would never accuse anybody of pedophilia. I believe that's a very serious accusation. And they went on from there. The next day, Pat McAfee comes on the show. He says, man, at the end of that Aaron Rodgers Tuesday, it got real loud. It got real loud up in here. And he's like, I'm kind of happy that's over. Like, we're happy the Aaron Rodgers Tuesdays are done. NFL season's done. I'm happy that that chapter's over for now. All the media outlets the next day ran with that, saying, Pat McAfee kicked Aaron Rodgers off his show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it and it snowballed. The, obviously, the left-leaning media ran with that first. And this what surprised me was that the right-leaning media started just he- picking up headlines from the left. And just saying, Pat McAfee kicked Aaron Rodgers off the show. He's a sellout. He's the worst. He doesn't want to speak truth. He's scared. He cowered. He bent the knee. And I'm sitting here as, a, as an actual fan of the show. And I'm like, no. He just come, Aaron Rodgers comes on for the season. And when the season's done, which it is now, he goes on vacation. They don't have him on the show until the next se- NFL season. But everyone's running with this. And even podcasts that I respect... We're running with this. The Patrick Beth David podcast came out saying, wow, I cannot believe Pat McAfee. He's in bed with these awful people at ESPN, and they made him bend the knee and made him apologize. I was was like, Patrick, you and all these crazy right-leaning, I say crazy, but other right-leaning conservative entities are just running with this? Have you been telling and lecturing the world on how you can't trust left-leaning media, and you're just headline taken from them? And run with it and just claim as if it's fact. Obviously, that's something we've been trying to grow in as a show here. And then I got to watch it in full real time. With people I actually have trusted over over the couple of year, last couple of years. And I was like, wow. If this is what they're doing with this issue, what are they doing with other things I'm not as well versed in? Mm-hmm. Like, I know this one very well. And I know that you're off on this one. What are you doing with this one over here? So that leads us into our show today. <laughs> where... We are trying to be a show that we've been able to take some time to recognize that we've learned over the past, I'd say, month, month and a half, that we've got a bigger audience than we've realized. It's getting larger. And this is no longer a show where just my parents tune in uh, five listeners a week. We're now talking into the thousands and thousands of people who listen to us every week. And 
that's different. We're not, so we've realized that we have a responsibility to make sure we're on top of our game and watching what we're saying, but also speaking truth to where the truth needs to be, but taking care of the facts as, as they come in. We're not journalists, but we're going to act like journalists, I guess, and we're going to continue this party going forward. And before we get into our next story, Reg, do you want to say anything on that before we get this party started? No, I think that's a perfect segue, honestly. It's a, it's a heartbreak, mm-hmm. honestly, for you when you're listening to your podcasters and they're peddling something that you realize to be wrong. It's it's heartbreaking. And I feel like that's where I'm at with this next story, honestly. I feel heartbroken. So for anybody who missed it right before Christmas, because it came out very, very quietly, the Houston government in Nova Scotia, they released this green energy plan for Nova Scotia saying, we're going to go full force into green energy. They have signed contracts with um, Germany actually to export hydrogen. And part of this plan, they said that they're going to build five gigawatts of offshore wind. And they're going to do that through leasing um, marine land along the coast of Nova Scotia, which sounds amazing. It sounds great. It's like, okay, here's a really easy way to create green energy, create green hydrogen, because you're going to use the energy that's produced by these windmills to then create the hydrogen. It's not going to be something that's going to be based off of a coal fired plant. Sounds great. I was excited. I was like, yes, this government knows what they're doing. And then I had my heart broken a little bit because then I started looking into the math and I was like, "Uh oh, (laughs) the math is not mathing. And so I kind of did a big analysis of it and to build Fifth, sorry, five gigawatts of electricity offshore, you need about 556 windmills to do that. And at a price of about 31 million per windmill. So that's going to include things like, this is an estimate too. This is going to include things like making sure that you have a cement base in place, making sure that things are transported over across an ocean and making things uh, actually usable and putting down wire and actually getting things connected to the onshore plant. So it roughly look works out to around 31 million per, per windmill. These windmills have a lifespan of about 20 to 25 years. When I actually looked at the price of hydrogen and the amount of hydrogen that these windmills could produce, we're looking at about three to six dollars per kilogram of hydrogen at the low point it would take 20 years to pay back the initial investment, just the break even point for all these windmills, just selling the hydrogen at a $3 amount at a $6 amount. Sorry, no, that was wrong. At a $3 amount, it'd be 40 years at a $6 amount. It'd be the 20 years. So at the highest amount that you can sell this hydrogen for, (laughs) we would be breaking even at the same time that all these windmills would be breaking down. I was devastated. I was like, no, this, <laughs> this is what we want. We want a green hydrogen future, but it's not looking like that's the way to do it. And so one of the things I was looking at, cause I was discussing this with my wife, I was like, this is heartbreaking for me. Cause this is something I wanted to see. And it's something that the government is actually planning to move forward with. But I was like, this is really terrible for the province if we do this in this way. And she kind of said, well, could we just use the windmills to create electricity for a bit, pay them off and then use hydrogen. And I kind of mom, like mulled that over for a little bit. And when I looked at the actual amount of energy you could produce with these windmills and what you could sell it for, if you sold it at a rate, like in Nova Scotia, we pay around 17 to 20 cents a kilowatt hour based on whatever time of day it is or how much you're using. Because sometimes when you use a certain amount, once you use over that amount, it actually becomes cheaper. So if you sell this at a rate of like 14 cents per kilowatt hour, you'd pay off all those windmills within seven years, which actually makes good financial fiscal sense. Uh, And then the problem is, and she said, well, that's great. If you pay them off in seven years, then you can produce hydrogen. I said, yeah, but then the problem is if you know that you can pay everything off in seven years and you can make this $17.5 billion that it's going to cost, uh, then why would you leave that money on the table to produce hydrogen that's then not going to produce that 17 billion in at year 14? And then let's say you stretch it to 21, you've, you know, triple X that money. Like why? <laughs> so green hydrogen, it's not, not looking good for me in my books. The only way I look at it and say, 
it might be a good move is it does solve the problem of storage. And that's one of the big issues that we're having right now in the world when it comes to energy is how do we store surplus energy? Storing it in hydrogen makes sense. The problem is, is that does it make fiscal sense? And that's just my heartbreak right now. <laughs> so, so there's the, uh, more on like me, I'm, I'm curious, walk me through how the technology of like a windmill works with hydrogen. So basically what you're doing is you're using the windmill to create electricity. The electricity comes to, you're using water, hopefully. A lot of places they actually use gas because you have more hydrocarbons to break down. So what you're doing is you're using electricity to actually break the covalent bonds between the hydrogen and the oxygen atoms. And you're creating hydrogen and oxygen. And in order to do that, you need an electrical um, current, you need a catalyst, and then you need your, your actual water to begin with. And so what happens is that the process of breaking those bonds it uses energy to do that. So therefore, it's less efficient. So whenever you move energy from one state to the next, you, you create inefficiencies. It's always most efficient to have energy in its purest state. Um, so that's kind of why even windmills, they have had leaps and bounds in their technology because taking mechanical energy, the wind blowing, turning it into electrical energy, you're running magnets over coils of waters, wires to move electrons around to actually create that electricity. So it's it's not a very efficient process either. Mm -hmm. So it's it's a lot of inefficiencies, but it's the cleanest way you can do it, right? So <laughs> it's just challenging because you have to have a on land facility. You have to make sure all these windmills are performing at their peak performance. When I did the calculation, I was looking at um, efficiency rates so that I wasn't giving them 100% efficiency. I was bringing it down to like 70%. Uh, I was also um, looking at the rate of conversion of the, the, uh, the fluid into hydrogen. And I was looking at that at a rate of 40% because that's actually the industry standard is 40% efficiency. So I, I pulled all those numbers into it. So it's a lot of, a lot of math to go into it. And I can... I can put those numbers out there if anybody is actually really interested in it. But uh, just to say, I really wanted it to work. Mm -hmm. I really did want it to work. And I did want it to be as honest of a representation as possible. So I did go out and get the industry averages for these things. So there might be cases where you have wind blowing and these windmills are running at 100% capacity, which is amazing. Very rarely does that happen. But we're a province that's surrounded by water on three sides, so you never know. And we've got the Atlantic Ocean providing us wind. But that said, <laughs> things still break down, and those breakdown costs and maintenance costs I didn't include in the calculation because I figured that if I'm changing things on efficiency level, I'll just kind of factor that in and it will come, all come out in the wash. Right. But uh, dang. And I remember when you first got into this and you were super psyched about just him Houston making this announcement, uh, you saw a lot of different advocacy groups saying this is an idiotic idea don't don't <laughs> run with this but they weren't exactly you know smart in terms of how you were looking at it they were going at it from more of an emotional perspective of how this is not going to work what were they saying so yeah that was i remember telling you that because i was just like oh man so there was a couple of different environmental advocacy groups out there that were saying this is a terrible idea and they were saying, because it's going to destroy the fish habitat, and which one is incorrect. If you look at Denmark as an example, they actually created a protected fish zone because basically you can't trawl, and that's when you have boats out on the water that scrape the bottom of the, the, the ocean. You can't do that around windmills because you have all these wires that you just haul up with you. So it actually creates a fish habitat. But they were like, oh, no, it's going to destroy the fish habitat. Migratory seabirds are going to be impacted and all this stuff. And I was just like, that is the biggest load of BS I've ever heard. That is not the case. And we also have to remember all energy is a trade-off. Like you don't want to use coal-fired plants because they're completely polluting the air and everything around them. But we need the energy from them. So that's what we've got right now. But then you have these same people going, do not build windmills because they're going to impact the birds and they're going to impact the fish and it's going to be terrible. It's like, well, everybody's being impacted some way. You have to pick the, the way of least harm. And this is the way of least harm. Right. Stop holding it back. But then the problem was, is that when I went and did the math, I was like, crap, the hydrogen model doesn't work fiscally. 
So it's like, I agree with you in that, like this might not be the best way forward, but not for the stupid reasons that you put forward. <laughs> hey, well, that's kind of been the critique of green energy period, no matter what type we're talking about is the fact they're just so inefficient and cost so much money up front that what are we even get? We're, we're getting an inferior product for more money. Why are we going to make the switch? Mm -hmm. You know, well, it's because it's going to save the world and it's actually looking like it's going to make the world worse in some cases. So that's kind of where we're kind of stuck right now. We're seeing this over in Alberta, which we'll get here that story here soon, where they are maxing out their capacity. They're having to borrow energy from other provinces um, because they're in the kind of the midst of this green transition uh, as their industry has been gutted by the federal and then previously provincial government of the, the NDP. And they're they're stuck right now um they're they're getting through it but negative 40 weather and they were entertaining the idea of rolling blackouts yikes mm. so when we're thinking about this whole transition to green energy what are like is there actually anything that we can see right now that we could reasonably transition over to that will at least see for a to the degree of that it'll be there won't be a net loss it'll be maybe not a net positive but stay the same Are we seeing anything like that we could try out yeah, so there's a couple things I want to say there. So when we think about the inefficiencies of green energy, the problem that we're not looking at too is we're not looking at the system as a whole. When we look at our current combustion um, for energy right now, where we're burning coal, we're burning gas, we're burning bunker C, uh, we're not taking into the fact that that affects everyone's lungs, that affects um, the crops around you because you're now dropping particulate matter onto fields. You're not taking into the account those health impacts and then those health impacts on people that are then using the healthcare system. So it's kind of hard because you're not capturing everything. That's why they call it a wicked problem because there's so many inputs and outputs that you have to try and track to try and get a good understanding of the whole issue. The second thing I'll say though is that when you look at green energy, you have to look at it as a mix. You can't look at, at it as one solution. Again, going back into that complexity thing, and it really is going to rely on provinces working together and sharing a grid. And I know that everybody freaks out when they hear that because you look at the example of Hydro-Quebec where they've been ruthless to Newfoundland, connected to Newfoundland. They own um, one of the big hydroelectric dams in Labrador and they've just been giving it to Newfoundland. So I understand where people are concerned and I think that's where we need to get away from this whole like my province against your province because when we talk about energy, it has to be a mix across the provinces because different provinces have different things to offer. We can offer wind. Uh, Alberta actually could offer a lot of geothermal because they're right on the Rockies. And so there's a lot of activity underneath those mountains that could provide heat because that's literally what we're doing when we're in a power plant. We're using either coal, we're using uranium we're using natural gas to heat water to create steam to turn a turbine to create electricity that's what we're doing we're heating water so if you've got a province like alberta with all this natural heat coming out i don't know if anybody's ever been to uh, calgary but if you go there and you go to the hot springs that water is being heated naturally it's already happening take advantage of that that's what we're trying to do we're trying to heat water so if you already have that happening do that bc massive hydro dams there Excellent. Alberta, or sorry, not Alberta, Quebec and Ontario, also hydro dams. But as far as like actually looking at windmills in those provinces, probably not the best idea. Atlanta, Canada, put windmills everywhere. And what you have to do is then you have to look at when one system is not as efficient as the other, you need to turn the other one on. And so we need to move away from this idea of everybody kind of doing their own thing. And we need to look more at how do we share the energy resources across the grid and work together as a country rather than one province versus the other. Right. Interesting. Oh, that's a good point, man. I appreciate that. <laughs> there you go. Well, I think, you know, on that note where at this point, the hydrogen idea for how, for at least Nova Scotia may not be viable at this point. They're going to go and try and try it anyways. We're going to go across the country and address another energy issue that's happening. Uh, it was a rough weekend for our homies out in Saskatchewan, Alberta. Uh, real cold, talking like negative, negative 40 mm. temperatures yikes no thank you i'm out here just uh enjoying my plus six weather out here in nova scotia <laughs> i have a i have a story for that just really quickly so 
we have a compost bin outside and I was saying to Jen, I was like, oh, my wife, I was saying, oh, I'll just grab the, the compost and take it out there. And I looked around the entryway and I didn't have any shoes readily available. So I was like, you know what? I'll just walk in bare feet. It's fine. The ground's frozen. As soon as I walked out, foot straight in the mud. And I was like, man, I hate this. But at the same time, it's plus six out and I'm not paying to heat my house very hard. I am so much happier that I'm here than I am in Saskatchewan. So, <laughs> Jeez, seriously, dude. Uh, unreal. Well, Alberta hit in the head, had some problems. Uh, Alberta's electrical grid recovers after extreme cold prompts threat of rolling power outages. Could you imagine, Reg, dealing with negative 40 temperatures and then being told, oh, yeah, you probably aren't going to be able to use your power to heat your home? Yeah. Yikes. Um, so a high risk of rotating power outages has eased in Alberta after an emergency alert was issued on Saturday night. High power demand caused by the extreme cold is putting pressure on the grid, said the emergency alert issued at 6.44 p.m. Mountain Time. Residents were asked to immediately reduce electricity use to essentials only. The Alberta Emergency Man Management Agency urged Albertans to turn off unnecessary lights, avoid cooking with a stove, and delay charging electric vehicles. Woohoo! The Alberta electric system operator ended the grid alert, meaning that power system is under stress and preparations were underway to use emergency reserves to meet demand and maintain reliability for the system just before 9 p.m. Mountain Time. An urgent appeal to Albertans to conserve electricity tonight was instrumental in avoiding a rotating power outages, said AESO, the independent operator of Alberta's electric system. Jay, I just think like when you see things like this, what is the federal government saying? When they look at this and go, oh, crap, everybody's going to be really upset if we start pushing the carbon tax, we start increasing, increasing that, we start pushing the green energy plan in a way that's going to support rolling blackouts, basically. Like, what is their media people saying about this? We're screwed. <laughs> that, that's what they're saying. <laughs> because that's what they're pushing is we want an all electric future. That's their plan. Yeah. And when you think about it, like we'll, we'll even take Nova Scotia for what we know here, from what I've heard, uh, even from people who listen to the show, like our infrastructure is super dated and can't handle if everyone mm -hmm. had electric vehicles on top of like, we have to replace a lot of our infrastructure to be able to maintain that level of usage electricity wise. So kind of what you're talking about earlier, the idea of diversifying the power might be a, a smart way to go um, because I don't think our country, let alone these diff different provinces, can handle a 100% electric future. No. We, we can't. We, it, you, too costly. You need a backstop, too. That's the other thing, too, is that, like, I look at things like nuclear, which, honestly, I'm not a fan of, and I've said this before, and I think it's funny that we're having this conversation right now because I think the very first conversation I had on the show was really about power and yep. rolling outages across Europe. But it's one of those things where I'm like, I don't like nuclear because I don't like the way that you have to extract the uranium. It's very harmful to the environment. The other problem is that what do you do with the waste? It's frustrating in that way, but it's so much cleaner than the other ways that we're generating electricity. And it's so much uh, healthier for the environment and for human health and that's my job. I'm in human health. So I look at this and go, you have to look at the trade off. And like, I hate it, but you, you have to sometimes swallow things that you don't like. Take, take your medicine. Yeah. Uh, swallow the pride a little bit. Cause this is the issue I had even before Trudeau took power in 2015, where it was this idea that he kept pushing during his, uh, his campaign to his leadership was we need an, uh, a green plan. We need to move to a green future. This, that, the other. And when he first got in, he completely gutted Alberta's industry. They gutted their industry um, and gave them a really hard time. And it was kind of like, we're just going to move to green now. It was ne there was never a transitionary plan that was put in place that would actually help people transition to, a, to cleaner forms of energy. It was just, we're just going to do this now. And now we're having these different issues that we've seen by these policies with Rachel Notley's NDP that was in power from 2015 to 2019 inking a deal worth $1 billion to shut down three coal fire power plants in Alberta. Now you have an issue where they can't sustain their high demand during a negative 40 weather pattern where they then had to pull, obviously Scott Moe helped out by giving a bunch of electricity from Saskatchewan. They also pulled from BC and also pulled from Montana to be able to get through that time. As mm -hmm. you're talking about, it's good to be able to work with others to get through tough times. And that's putting Alberta, like Alberta's in a tough spot. And 
obviously the 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 east ontario mainly what i'm talking about in that people in that province lefties in that province are going to be are laughing at, unfortunately they're laughing at alberta they're laughing at saskatchewan because of their d- political differences uh you guys can't get anything together you we need more left policies of what the simple person's going to say and meanwhile it's these types of policies that have completely handicapped this province and putting them in, put them in tough spots and why they double down people like daniel smith to try mm-hmm. and get them out of it it's funny because i just recently on my social media came across a couple ads for a company based out of Nova Scotia. And it's funny because they were saying about how we need to transfer to the, you know, a green future. And you're like, yeah, I totally agree with that. So I'm like, that makes sense why I'm seeing this. But then when they talk about the people and they said, and then you have all these grumps, and this is the word they use. They said the grumps that don't want to move to a green future. And they just show this like guy and they've got him kind of with bad teeth and some clothing that's like not looking like very nice and some of the clothing that they had on some of the other quote unquote grumps that they were highlighting made them look like they're blue collar workers. I was like, Ooh, I hate that a lot. Uh, that, uh, elitism that they're trying to push. And then they have them, they just like this, like they're, you know, just, and I just arms crossed and they're upset and they're grumpy and they're just stick in the mud and they don't know anything and they're dumb and they're, you know, lower than you because they don't agree with you. And I hate that. And that's kind of the politics that I'm seeing around energy right now. And it's like, no, we can't actually transition yet. I want to get to that future. Let me be clear. I want to get to a future where we are using clean sources because it's better for the environment. It's better for people's health and we can get there, but it's not going to be an overnight thing. And it's not going to be something that's going to be cheap. It's going to be something that's going to take decades to then pay back to break even to then get ahead. And (laughs) that seems to be the part that people are missing. And I hate when I see these government ads and some of these green company ads because they're making money off of us transitioning to their future. So of course they're going to push whatever narrative they think is going to get them there. And we have to take that into consideration too. They're not just, you know, innocent and completely altruistic out there going, we're doing this for the bunnies and, and the fish and the, and the children. It's like, no, you're not. You're doing that because it's going to be a lot of money in your pocket. I used to hold a couple of green energy companies in my uh, investment portfolio and they did very well. So <laughs> it's not all altruism. And so it makes me mad when I see these kind of politics come into play. When you have a government that's left leaning, like Rachel Notley, who signs away billions of dollars in contracts, and it's all like, this is for the common good. It's like, yeah, but somebody's still making money at the end of the day on this. And I'm not against people making money, but at the same time, we need to to recognize that. So to call people out and say that they're not on board or they're dumb or or to try and classify a group of people like they were depicting in these ads as, you know, being beneath you because they disagreed with you like that to me just set me on fire i was so mad (laughs) well it goes back to something i wasn't planning to talk about in this day show but i think it goes well into it where you know during the break there was a huge uh hubbub about uh one of pierre polyev's rallies where he may have been using a green screen which we know wasn't the case um but the they took an issue with the green scheme which is another issue but there was one part of the speech that people got really upset about mainly on the left was that the person who takes electricity from the sky and puts it through a copper wire, you know, and they got all upset, like, oh, he's an idiot. That's not how electricity is made. La, la, la. And, and then he went on then to say in that very same speech about how there's these people in Ottawa who are these angels that know better for your future. They know better than who you are, and uh, they they think they are better than you. They, they think they're more knowledgeable than you, and he kind of created that you know that that more so populist perspective, right? Yeah. And those on the left were upset with that rhetoric of oh, you mean people that are like doctors or like pilots or you know? And again, it's this as you were saying this elitism that's created um, the blue collar versus the white collar. Uh, the amount of divisiveness in our society we can it's funny how we kind of have society is like a big cake like this and they figured out every which way to divide that cake <laughs> in every way shape or form to per people you can get upset with people for the most random things just because of how they have a pers- way they view something mm-hmm. and it has been bonkers i mean that's something that i've learned over the course uh, over the break 
is seeing because uh, we got some heat. We finally got our first little, little bit of heat from the right. And that was the first time we've only ever been attacked from the left on the show. That's only ever happened. First time it's ever happened on the right. And then I started seeing the ugly, ex- more extreme side of the right. And I was like, y'all are the same, same crazies <laughs> as the extremes on the left. Like, you all are nuts. You guys are just so bent out of shape, wanting to be hurt, wanting your fe- wanting to figure out what you can be mad about today. And you're not taking some time to actually look at nuance of conversation. And that's my problem. And I'm not even going to so, like, obviously you can take responsibility for yourself and you need to really own your crap. But I will also put that on our leaders that we've seen in the media mm-hmm. that's created that divisiveness in our society and created that anger. I mean, it's just exactly what I said two seconds ago. Somebody's making money off of it. And so when you're upset about something, say, who's financially benefiting from me being upset about this? Mm. Because that will probably give you a good indication of where the money stops and where maybe some of the amplification happens. And I think about these people and I think um, about the people who are upset. And we said, you know, you're far right, you're far left. It's almost like in my mind, like a parabola where you have the bulk majority of everybody is kind of up here in the normal, you know, we're debating everything going on. And then down on the bottoms, that's where your crazy level is. <laughs> and the majority of people are not in those spots. But if you listen to mainstream media, they would have you believe that that is the majority. And it's not. So I, I just find it really, really frustrating. Absolutely. Well, I think using the parabola is an interesting example. I, I go with the horseshoe. And that's why I say this. is because it's like this, but it almost gets to the point where it comes and they almost touch at yeah. the end where they're, they're both the same type of crazy. They both share the same attributes, but they just come from a different perspective on it. They're both racist. Um, they both say crazy crap. Um, they both just want to judge people based on how they look versus the content of their character. And it's absolutely frustrating and they tick me off. And that's why coming into this year, you're starting to sense, you're probably sensing as a listener right now that we're coming with a bit of an edge coming with a bit of, uh, agenda you want to say or kind of what we've experienced over the holidays is we're done with the extremes on both the left and the right we want to be a a show focused on really highlighting the middle and actually having real conversations about the actual issues that are happening and what we're seeing and not people not ignoring things because it suits their political perspective but we're focused on trying to highlight issues that matter to people that are affecting them and bringing our communities together, unifying people, and kicking out the Trudeaus of the world who want to divide people with his megaphone, the Freelands of the world. Um, I will go even as far as the PPC bros uh, on the other side of it, who just want to keep fueling that fire, get them all fired up, continue to rage farm people into getting a little really fired up. Because as you said, someone's making money. You look at these YouTube people, and they got 80,000, 90,000, 100,000 views, in some cases, 500,000 views on their videos. You said it right, Rich. Someone's making money off your anger. You're watching these videos. I can tell you, they're making a lot of money off those AdSense videos. Mm-hmm. Someone's making money off your frustration. Us included. <laughs> um, but we're just trying to bring a little bit more light to the conversation uh, and trying to be a little more honest with it. Yeah. And it's just one of those things, too, where I, I look at it like, man, we need to just have a deep breath, take four weeks off like we did and have a look at some of these issues. Some of them you have to laugh at, like the Trudeau airplane down south. (laughs) I looked at that and I said to Josh, I said, do we even want to talk about that? Like, it's just, it's another Trudeauism. It's just dumb. Like, it doesn't serve anyone. (laughs) It is funny though. I'm not going to lie. I I watched it and I was like, man, again, (laughs) it's just more ridiculousness. But uh, I think that some of the other things that we've seen this week, or I guess it would have been, was it last week that uh, the reporter incident happened? And we're about to get right into it. Oh man, I I can't wait for that one. I'm going to let you take that one away because I, I first saw that I laughed my butt off. (laughs) (laughs) I'm also trying to not swear as much this year. So (laughs) that's fair. Um, Yeah. So, 
we're going to get into it. Those who probably, you, those who follow politics, you know what's happened. Uh, Rebel News, uh, getting into the mix again with the Liberal Party of Canada. And uh, we have David Menzies com- coming, approaching men, uh, Finance Minister Christian Freeland outside of an event to recognize the deaths of the Canadian plane that was shot down in Iran, uh, or say, I should say, Iran. And, and he was just, you know, doing what, what David Menzies is known for, um, ambushing people with some uh, wild questions and getting the people fired up. So this is uh, this is what happened. He is not a terrorist group. Why is your government supporting Islamo nationalism? What? You're what are you doing? You're under arrest for assault. Why are you booking me? You're under arrest for assault. Who are you? You're under arrest for assault. What are you talking about? Police, you're under arrest. How am I under arrest? You bumped into me. You pushed into me. You bumped. I was just scrubbing. I got my credentials here, and you just bumped into me. So excuse me. Police, you're under. (laughs) So uh, to those who are listening, uh, what happened was. David Menzies is approaching Christian Freeland and he's just questioning her and throwing some questions at her. Obviously, she uh, does what she does, is not answering. And then runs what we love to see uh, in basketball and uh, runs up off a pick. And uh, the RCMP officer just sitting, standing there. David Menzies doesn't see him, um, gets a blindside pick from the officer as Christian keeps walking by. And then the officer then turns around and says, <laughs> you're under arrest for assaulting an officer. And he said, huh? <laughs> and that's kind of what happened with the whole issue. And say this, the issue I had with this whole pro with this incident was people seeing personalities. There's mm-hmm. like, ah, there's a lot of people who don't like David Menzies. Don't like what he's about. Doesn't like his, his former journalism who said, no, he deserves it. And there's others who obviously are very lo- who love Rebel News a lot, love what David Menzies does, and so this is disgusting and an overreach of power. I want to speak to both those sides and just say it doesn't matter who it is. He is a journalist, whether you like his former journalism and how he covers things or not. If you don't, if you like Rebel News or not, it doesn't really matter. Look at this from an objective objective perspective. Someone, a journalist, was trying to question someone in in government and they had an RCMP officer stand in their way, manufacture him getting hit and then turn around and arrested the journalist for assaulting an officer. I've never seen this in my time wa- watching and understanding politics in this country. Never seen it happen here. This would never happen during the Chrétien days. Wouldn't happen the, during the Martin days. Wouldn't happen during the Harper days. I don't know what's going on, but this is absolutely crazy. And the fact that people are defending it is ultra, even more concerning to me. Well, that's exactly what I thought because I looked at this and I went, I don't like rebel news. I don't read their stuff. I think it's completely biased. And half the time I think that it's made up, but that doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. They don't like rebel news and it doesn't matter. They don't like that journalist because what does matter is that the fact that he did not assault a police officer and could not question an elected official, which we have the right to because we pay their salaries. That's the big thing that I want to always harp on is the fact that like the government doesn't have its own money. We provide the government with money. We provide their salaries. They should answer to questions that are asked of them. Whether or not she wants to answer while she's walking down the street, whatever, you know, that his approach, do I love his approach? No, probably not. But that doesn't matter. The fact of the matter is that when you involve the RCMP in this, then it becomes a serious issue. Because then what happens if you get a government that is even more extreme than Trudeau? What happens if you get that government and then they start having RCMP officers bump into people? Because we've set a precedent now that you can arrest journalists by just bumping into them on the sidewalk. That is not assault. There was no intent. There was no action of insult. Like, if that's the case... Half the people walking down Spring Garden right now are assaulting each other because it's not wide enough and you're hitting people in giving shoulders. Like, it's just not assault. (laughs) And obviously it wasn't because the charges didn't sand. Like, they dropped the charges because they realized it was ridiculous. And all it was was a move to shut down conversation. And I think it backfired on them because now the country is watching this going, oh, wow, 
that is wild. I can't believe that happened. And they actually asked Chrissy Freeland about that later. And then when she was asked about that, she just said, I do not get involved with matters of the RCMP and I don't think politicians should get involved in matters of the RCMP. So therefore that's all I'm going to say. Yeah. And I was like, cool. (laughs) Thanks for nothing. Big nothing sandwich again. Absolutely. Her exact quote was politicians have no role in police decisions. Really? Tell me how, what was your role in the 2022 of February? You seem to have a role in police decisions then Mm -hmm. my friend. And you defended those decisions interesting so when it matters when it, or sorry when i said it when it conveniences them they have no role in these matters meanwhile you could see from my perspective this is now just speaking uh just as an opinion on this she knew what she was doing oh yeah she's like she saw she looked ahead she smiled you saw the smile you saw the snicker and she's like all right you send a pick from me can't roll off and boom and then you get what you get right here right and so I think what you said is is spot on. It's a concerning precedent. We cannot allow it to stand. We can't not. We cannot um, justify it. We can't. We should not be the ones to explain this away. This is wrong on all levels. And I would never. We it can't be in our politics whatsoever. It should mm-hmm. not. It shouldn't even be a thing. But hey, when we're taking cues off of of uh, leadership in China and how they do things, well, I get that's what what you get out of this. Yeah, I mean. <laughs> it's funny when you said justify it. I was like, justify it. <laughs> There's been many things that have been justified. I, I feel like because even just listening, you already mentioned it. The people that were defending this, that is what's most concerning. Because I expect this out of our current government, out of this current regime. I expect that fully. If they could get away with more, they probably would. They probably are. And we just don't know about it yet. We'll find about it after this government is out of power. The full breadth of what we relied about and what happened. The rest of the world is looking at Canada right now going, you guys don't even know what you don't know because you're not even seeing it. And we are, that concerns me. But the biggest, biggest, biggest concern I have is the fact that we have people much like when the Nazi was brought into to parliament and people are going, Oh, well there's different levels of Nazi. And like, no, no, there's not. There really is not like the pretzeling that happens with people's morality that's what's concerning to me and that's what kind of just it makes me sad makes me concerned and then makes me angry and then i have to like pull myself back and go okay locus control again what has been in my control here and the people around me are and so i have these conversations with friends friends who are very left-leaning um who are like oh well you know it's not that big a deal i'm like okay i love you a lot why do you think it's not a big deal and then trying to have those conversations in a really caring and really thoughtful way and that is a lot of work sometimes <laughs> asking a lot yeah yeah but i mean i still do it mm-hmm. i tell you stories about uh, it's a couple friends that i have that uh you're like how can you even have conversations with them it's because we have to have conversations with these people they're our neighbors they're our family members they're people we care about they're in our community and frankly they're probably thinking the same thing about us so if we're not willing to have that conversation and put that all branch out there why would we expect the same from them? And this is the kind of division that happens in our country that we need to move away from. So we have to have these conversations and this kind of garbage needs to stop. Yeah. I, I couldn't agree more, dude. And I think, what do I think on this? If I want to think my final thoughts is that you said it best. I think we, we can come to expect this from this current government. I think, forever and ever i'll always hold their feet on uh, to the fire on everything they do uh, or do not do and um and i just i wish i could have said i wish when i saw this happen i guess i was surprised Mm -hmm. but i wasn't and this goes back to some things where I, i see this online all the time where you vote this person in you're gonna get this and you're gonna deserve it you know you deserve what you get you're gonna you're gonna love when this happens and I want to, something I learned over the holidays is just reading up on different totalitarian governments over history is they're going to put people in positions to defend them. So there's never really going to be a point where it's like some of these people that you're, you're fighting with online, I hate to tell you, they're never really going to get it. There's some, there's some people that will like the moderate people who just want 
to live a good life, they'll get it at some point. But there's just there's extremes on both sides, and you're not you're talking to a brick wall. We saw it during COVID. We had pe- people ratting each other out because they're having parties at their houses. We saw it in this country. It, that wasn't often Soviet Russia in the '60s. That happened here, and you're gonna have people around you who, when things get tough, and their will's bent, they will do do the bidding of of what's happening in that day. And I want you just to kind of, you said at the beginning, this is why it's important to have these conversations now. So that if that we ever get to that type of point, well, hopefully we've won some people over and realize and, um, and they're able to see through a lot of this stuff. Justin Trudeau warned us before he got into power. Mm-hmm. He admires China's basic dictatorship and he's been taking notes throughout his whole time in power. Yeah. It's funny too, because I think about what you just said about those people who are doing the bidding, who are defending the, the totalitarianism. It's interesting too, when you look at, when you push somebody into a corner, you start making power extremely expensive. So they are facing minus 40 degree weather. You start creating food bank usage that is at unprecedented levels. You start taking away people's ability to bring home a proper income by taxing them on every single thing at every single level from income all the way down to their their groceries. Like you're going to put people into a situation where it's do or die and it's you know survival and if survival for them in that moment means they have to bend their morality in order to survive that's what's going to happen and I think that's what we're seeing happen honestly in a lot of cases. There is some people that are delusional, but I think that there's a lot of people too that may be in positions where they want to speak out because I've been there where you want to speak out about something that you don't agree with, but you feel trapped. You feel trapped in that narrative that you have to keep, maybe not shouting out, but maybe humming along because you have to, because that's what's signing your paycheck. That's what's you know putting food on the table, and that's what's keeping the lights on, because any disruption at all is going to gonna crush you. So I think that we need to also take some some time to be gentle with those people too, because you know you don't know what situation they're in. Wish I could say I agree, um, but in some cases, yes, I do agree. In other cases, I think it's um, those people are going to cost you your life. Mm-hmm. Is more so I'm getting that. Um, you know, being gentle with someone who is going to put you in is 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 going to put you in a position where you're going to be crushed. That's a, that's a, that's tough to ask of somebody. That's a survival question again. Mm-hmm, exactly, and so that's why I'm saying let's talk about preventative measures <laughs> on this end, so we don't be put in that position. Agreed. Um, where yeah, you do have these these conversations, and you're able to like we're at a point now, even with as crazy as things are getting, we're still I I would say we're still in a position where we can be still be gentle with people. Um, you don't have to shut people out as much as people love to shut each other out. I know. Um, like that. Like we're not at that level yet. But we're on a, we're on a path. I, could, I wish I could say I was being extreme and hyperbolic, but I, I let's just say my mind's been changed since 2020. Um, I've seen how people react when they're put under pressure, and it's made me a little uneasy in, at different points. Um, so now that we're in this kind of like brevity period where we're the there's still being there's constant pressure being put on people, but it's nowhere near what it was back in 2020 2021. That, that will come again. And I'm just trying to like you know, set things up, get to know people, understand where they're coming from, have those conversations while we can now before they get to a point where people are double, doubling down on what they think is right and chaos erupts in the streets. Yeah, it's funny because I think that we come from such different experiences that too. Because during COVID, like I worked with a whole bunch of healthcare workers and we were having barbecues in the backyard, talking about how crazy the world was, being very supportive of each other. And then I remember you saying you had people who were like, do not leave your house for a walk. <laughs> and it's just funny because like my my perspective then coming through is like, people are all reasonable and, and should be reasoned with. <laughs> and yours is like, people be insane. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I mean, I think that's what makes this conversation interesting, right? Yeah. Our, our experiences are what, are what make us. And I think, uh, I would agree. I wouldn't, I would totally have that perspective um, prior to 2020, hundred percent. Um, but what I saw of people that I love and know and what they did to people that I thought they loved, who I, th- who I thought they cared for and how they treated them through this. 
I was like, man, y'all, like, I can't trust. There's people I just can't trust again. <laughs> I, I literally, I cannot trust them again. Um, as I got much as I would love really to. lucky then. I got really lucky because all my neighbors around me too, they were like, this is all wild. You guys are good. Don't worry. Mm-hmm. Do your thing. Live your life. Yeah. I, I think too is, as you said, you're, you're around a bunch of healthcare workers, which helps because you know, you had a better idea of what was happening. Oh yeah. Versus people on the outside, you're being told what's happening on the inside. And you're just kind of like, oh man, it must be really bad. Uh, and then you, then people get scared, um, are terrified. Uh, I saw everything that happened with Ian Rankin, Tim Houston, <laughs> um, during the, the highway blockades up near Amherst. You, you mean that. um Higgs, not Tim Houston. Nope. Tim Houston. Oh. Oh, okay. I see what you're when saying. They, yeah, when yeah. they ousted Elizabeth Smith McCrossin. Right. Um Houston ousted her out of the out of the party. Ian Rankin was an absolute coward. And called her a bunch of names as is the Trudeau playbook. Uh, and those who don't, who don't know Nova Scotia politics, right? Rankin was the liberal leader at the time. And then obviously a premier Blaine Higgs, who uh, was the conservative leader in New Brunswick and they are doing their whole thing. And what I heard, actually, no, I can't say it, but I was just saying is I have, z- let's say I have zero negative respect for Ian Rankin. Mm-hmm. I think the guy is a coward. He he's not a leader, and I hope he never ends up in his position of leadership of this province, because he will do whatever it takes to save his job and save his skin, and he doesn't care about anybody else. And he's my MLA. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! Good luck, sucker! <laughs> Holy smokes! Okay, so we're, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna close this one off. We're gonna cap this one off because something happened during the holidays, which I thought was interesting was the insane blow up people had of this movie on Netflix, Leave the World Behind. Mm-hmm. And everyone's kind of talking about the movie itself. Like, oh man, that ending sucked. That was the worst. She just spent the whole movie trying to find an episode of Friends. It's ridiculous. <laughs> and then they had people who were like, okay, there's a bunch of signs in this movie. The Obamas who are the executive producers were warning us about this. Are they warning us? What's what's gonna happen? Are, are we gonna see chaos? Uh, is there gonna be a huge grid out outage? Is there gonna be a huge um, internet hack? What's gonna happen? And there was all kinds of talk on TikTok of all the different subliminal messages in this movie. And either way, the movie itself, ah, I thought it was okay. I didn't mind it. I thought it was pretty good, interesting. It kept kept the anxiety levels up. I, I enjoyed this. It was pretty good. Um, but. It was the conversation that stemmed it with it uh, about it with my wife Kelsey afterwards, where I was like, "Hmm." So, in u- user experience design, which is what I do for a living, we ha- have this thing, um, this mechanism that we call priming. We use it to uh, when we're kind of designing digital products. We kind of give little clues and signals, uh, whether it be visual ver- uh, or by sound, of like reminding the user of how they should use product um for example uh when you're using a mobile device the back button is typically always in the top left corner um these are just kind of different visual pieces of language that you do to remind user of like how you push them along in the flow whether it be the the buttons in the bottom right corner this that the other i turned around to kelsey and i was like this video seems like there's a lot of priming happening i feel like it feels like this was a bit of a priming of society of like something could be coming now I'm not speaking on factual facts at this point, but I'm when there's smoke, I'm I'm starting to see maybe there's a fire. And Kelsey says, "Ah, oh, you're crazy! Like it's just a movie. Enjoy it. If anything, um, it's just it is what it is. Just enjoy it for what it is." I'm like, "Whatever, sure." Then the trailer for Civil War comes out, and it's all about how America goes into a civil war. And it's with Kirsten Dunst and a couple other actors' names. And I said, oh, that's coming out in spring 2024. Huh. You don't think they're priming us yet, Kelsey? Oh, well, yeah. Okay, okay. Then Mark Zuckerberg and 10 other billionaires found building bunkers in various parts of this world. Uh, Obviously, Zuckerberg down in Hawaii. 
a couple others building theirs in New Zealand. And then you wonder, what is going to happen? And this is where obviously your conspiracy hats go on because this is weird. The fact that we're seeing so much media about civil um, discord, problems happening to our electrical grids, and we have an, an American election that's probably going to be the most contested election that we'll ever see in our lifetimes happening this year. Something's going down, dude. Yeah, it's it's not something that I would say that I haven't thought about, especially because my hat, I'm an evaluator, I'm a researcher. I work in health as a health researcher, evaluator, uh, coordinator. And so what I work with, I work with metrics, I work with uh, different frameworks, and I work with data. Day in, day out, I live in Excel. And when I look at the different metrics like happiness, quality of life, social determinants of health, um, anger, societal anger, hope for the future, these different things that are good indicators of like, what's the temperature of society right now? And they're all real bad. <laughs> and then we see things like, oh, the UK and the US just bombs a, bombed a couple of ships in the Red Sea. And it's like, Oh, great. So now we're getting into it with Yemen and you've got what's happening in Israel and it's still happening in Ukraine. And then China's talking about Taiwan again. And it's just like, or hasn't stopped talking about Taiwan to be quite honest. And I'm like, holy crap. (laughs) And then you have people in your own country and in your own community arguing about which bathroom to use. I'm like, are we really (laughs) talking about this right now? Is that the most important thing to be on our minds? And then, like you said, when you look at the amount of dystopian future um, content that is being pushed out and the amount of people who are looking at this and going, yeah, I think this could be a possibility. It's concerning. And it's not concerning because I think that it's a prophecy or anything, but I think it could be a self-fulfilling prophecy. And that's what's concerning to me. I've heard the quote before about the two wolves and it's like one is starving and, and uh, one is well fed and it's like hope is one and, and anger is the other. And it's whatever you feed is the one that's going to be um, well fed. And I really believe that that's kind of what we're seeing where it's like, if we are feeding into this dystopian future and we're feeding into this idea of uh, not trusting our neighbors and, acting in ways where we don't trust our neighbors we're ratting them out, you know, during COVID or we're, you know, not trusting them and cutting them out and canceling people because they have one different belief than you do. So therefore, because they don't accept the whole buffet, you don't invite them out to dinner. Like, you know what I mean? It's just that kind of mentality that I'm really done with. And I think that that's the problem is that we're, we're seeing that happen, that division and that complete cancellation of people that we're creating this future that we don't want. And that's what's concerning me is that self-fulfilling prophecy. And it's playing out in the metrics that I look at on quality of life, on hope, on life expectancy. Like one of the things I saw before Christmas was life expectancy has gone down consistently over the past three years in Canada. That's not a good metric to go down. And it's directly related to things like stress, heart disease, um, illnesses that are born from the way that you perceive the world, which is wild to think that our minds affect our bodies that much that we could bring down life expectancy. But I really, I really believe that that's what's happening. And I think you're right. I think there might be some priming happening where it's like, get ready. And I don't know if maybe, I don't know if I'd go as far as to say it's a completely intentional thing where it's people behind the curtain, you know, making it so I don't know if I'd go that far, but I wonder if it's because it's on people's minds so much that it's, that it's happening and it's coming out because that's what's top of mind. And people are naturally gravitating towards that because it's just feeding itself. But, yeah. I hear you. This is the meme that comes to mind for me. This is the, this is what media and government's doing right now. Come on, do something. They're, they're poking us, hoping something happens. That's what, how I view it with the media. I, politics is, is downstream from culture. And mm-hmm. what we're seeing in culture right now is the, uh, the an increase of media, specifically in 2024, coming out this year, end of 2023, these movies about just absolute chaos. And personally, speaking per- personally for my, myself, Josh Udall, I think this year, is going to make twenty the summer of twenty twenty 
look like nothing. I think we're coming up on an election in the States. I don't even know if we're going to get to a Canadian election next year. Like that's kind of where like before we see some like super crazy stuff happen is more so what I'm talking about. I don't know what's going to happen down south of the border. I don't know what's going on. All I know is both sides, liberals and conservatives alike, are stacking up on their guns. They're buying up ammo. That's, that's, talking about metrics, that one's concerning to me mm-hmm. as well. Um, that was happening back in uh, lead up the 2020 election where liberals had been, had purchased three times more ammo and guns than they ever have previously. Mm-hmm. Like, what's that going to look, what's that metric going to look like only in 2024? Uh, when all the work that's gone in to make sure Trump doesn't get in, what if he, what if just a bunch of crazy stuff happens where they keep him off a ballot? That's already kind of happened. Mm-hmm. Colorado, Maine, um, shenanigans happening in Iowa. People like, I'm talking about this meme, man. <laughs> <laughs> They're poking you, hoping something happens. Mm-hmm. And that's why I, I do think this isn't, obviously this is, I think this is intentional. And I don't know what's going to happen. All I know is if a, if a mad grid failure happened, however, I would say for those who are listening to the show, I think if they're warning us about it to some degree, I'd take it seriously to some to a point. You know, when you go to the grocery store, just buy a little bit extra. When you see some water, buy a little bit extra. Um, I, I would I'd start taking care of a little bit just in case something were to happen. And worst comes to worst, nothing happens. Well, you got some extra food and eat it later, whatever. <laughs> uh, but I would that's. Think about it. Take care of your family. Still love people. Love your community. Take care of those around you. But um, try to be prepared. I will say I am happy that we live where we live, though, because I interact with our provincial government on a weekly basis, just in the, the capacity that I'm in. And looking at our province, what's concerning about our province right now for me is debt ratios and things like that, but actually looking at like the way healthcare is going in our province, we're actually improving it. They're doing a really bad job of communicating that, which is kind of unfortunate because I was, I was at the locker room of the gym the other day and people were like, Oh my God, the hospital wait times, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, actually you don't know this yet because it hasn't been released yet, but we've cut hospital wait times in half in different parts of the province, just by different things that we're trying. It's incredible. It's awesome. And nowhere else in the country is doing that. We're trying all these new products that are developed in-house in Nova Scotia that nowhere else has that we're actually developing here. There's like so much good happening in this province that sometimes I think that the ridiculousness of the outside world is kind of like overpowering and overpowering that narrative. And so that's why I'm just going to push back against and say that I think that there's a, I would say I'm cautiously optimistic. Cautiously optimistic in the sense that I'm still getting my chicken coop this year and I'm, (laughs) I'm going to make myself as self-sufficient as humanly possible. Um, But at the same time, recognizing that I think there's a lot of good happening within our, within our own little space and what we can touch and see and know around us right now. I think things are dire, but they're not at that devastating level. And there's a lot of people working really, really hard to keep things in an upward trajectory it's just, it's really frustrating when you have a federal government that's pushing against you. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. Absolutely. I mean, you know, it's, we, we, I guess kind of quickly just moving south of the border, the stuff that I've seen happen and it's been going on, that, that stuff's concerning. That's what elevates mm-hmm. the temperature uh, and politically, especially the, the fiasco between Texas and the federal government right now. Yeah. Is really bad. Yeah. Well, we've got that happening here in, in Canada. I mean, look at Saskatchewan and the federal government. Yeah. That one's concerning too. Don't get me wrong. Um, I think like that's, I'm hoping that can deescalate at some point, but when you have Texas calling in their military, like well, I'm trying, what, what is it called? When the, um, the state has their own federal reserve. Um, either way, the state has their own army of sorts. Armed force, yeah. And they've told them to go to the, the border to secure it. Border security came and told, told them to stop. At what point do one, one of those two groups pull a gun on each other? 
that's like that's the temperature that's going on down there and we aren't sh- like it's just i hate this crap and i know we you made fun of me way back on this <laughs> um but it hasn't gotten better since i talked about it um and i will say the stuff that happens down in the states shortly comes up here unfortunately and as much as you want to see things de-escalate we talked about the sketch one of the federal uh canadian government here locus of control you know, you're talking about mm-hmm. it's so easy to see what's going on abroad get freaked out what reg was saying earlier i truly believe in continue to love your neighbors continue to love those around you continue to care for them continue to keep conversation open because the minute you give in to your fear and start being insular they win so as much as they're trying to goat you into thinking otherwise we've talked about on the show we're getting you know we're keeping an eye on what's happening we're not you know, we're not living in a world where we don't think it's going to happen. We're preparing for the worst, but hoping for the best. And we want to act like things are going to be for the best. So we just want you to continue loving people here on out. Yeah. So. Be cautiously optimi- optimistic. Yep. Couldn't agree more, sir. What a show that was. <laughs> Holy <laughs> jumping. We did everything. Yeah, it's good to be back. You know what I'm saying? Oh, gee. Well, whatever it is you're doing, whether you be going skiing crying over hydrogen oh true <laughs> or watching the the wild card weekend which actually just concluded watching football next weekend whatever it is you're doing wherever you are we love you we're out peace peace